So thank you for participating. Um, uh, I guess a talk with well-being uh, in the title, you would expect it might be about coronavirus, but unfortunately it is not. Um, it's uh, about some work I've been doing over a long period of time now about uh, measuring well-being. So first of all, uh, I just briefly, I won't go through all these points, but um, to start off with, um, I led the development of, um, uh, of a publication called Measures of Australia's Progress um, back in 2002. And actually was quite overwhelmed um, by the response we got to it. Um, in fact, um, the Bulletin used to have something like called the Smart Australian out there, and I won the society category for this publication, which wasn't something that I was inspecting. Expecting rather. Um, this work really started uh, with an Atlantic Monthly article in the uh, late 1990s during the um, Clinton period, the presidency period in the United States, where the economy was going really well. But uh, people weren't uh, feeling um, as well as what you would think uh, from such a strong economy. So the Atlantic Monthly asked, uh, wrote an article saying, uh, you know, the economy's going well, so well, why aren't Americans feeling so well? So that's what led to us uh, looking at different ways of measuring how our society was going and uh, ultimately led to MAP. The other thing I uh, wanted to mention was um, the second last bullet there, that uh, I am chair of uh, the advisory board of a, a project known as Australia's National Development Index or, or ANDI, which is, uh, it, which is still going and I, I will talk about that uh, briefly later on in the talk. So here's the outline of a talk. I, I, I will give um, uh, a brief history of, um, of uh, indicator movement. Uh, I'll talk a bit about approaches to measuring progress, the different approaches. Um, I'll talk a bit about the modalities for developing measures of progress. I'll talk about MAP, uh, some OECD initiatives. Uh, Andy, Australian National Development Index, which I just mentioned before. Um, which is a compass index, which creates its own problems, which I'll talk about. Uh, I'll talk briefly about New Zealand developments, some international developments, and the role of national statistical officers. And also, um, not right at the end of the talk, but about three quarters of the way through, I'll talk about some of the methodological challenges in developing a compass index. And there is an excellent overview of this, um, of, of this type of work provided in a paper by Rob Tanton and Jackie Shermer of uh, NatSEM at the University of Canberra. And on the last slide, um, I've got a reference to that. So just looking at um, briefly at the history, the um, 90, early 1970s was the start of the uh, social indicators movement. It was really kicked off by the um, OECD. And that probably partly uh, inspired some early attempts for adjusting uh, GDP to try and um, provide a uh, a better measure of well-being. The, the weaknesses of, of GDP were uh, well recognised then. So uh, some of our smarter economists uh, you know, tried to uh, make uh, that, uh, try a slightly different approach by adjusting GDP for the uh, uh, the goods and the bads to see what uh, what they came up with. And really, uh, the genuine progress indicator, which first appeared in the mid to late late nineteen um, eighties, was a, a, a version of this um, uh, GDP approach. It, um, it, it seems to have um, lost um, uh, a, bit of, um, uh, a bit of popularity. Uh, but at one stage in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was, uh, it was widely quoted and was um, uh, compiled for a number of different countries, not by national statistical offices, but um, various research institutes. The Australian Institute actually published it in Australia. But it, it started off with GDP and, and, and took away uh, um, things because of environmental degra degradation, uh, for example, inequality in income, uh, and a range of other things. Uh, and then added, uh, added when uh, uh, things like education uh, were going well um, and so forth. The 1990 um, uh, was when the UNDP developed the Human Development Index. Uh, uh, primarily as an advocacy tool uh, in the first instance, but it was a, a compass index and it was actually a fairly simple one. It didn't have too many variables. Uh, the original version just uh, was a compass index of things like education, about uh, three or four education indicators, um, income and, and health. 
Um, so just those three areas, health, um, education, income. Um, and it used to get a lot of publicity, but it, it had a lot of weaknesses. Uh, in particular, it, 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 they weren't great at getting accurate data from the countries. And at one stage, um, they had Australia ranked below Madagascar, which was clearly not, um, not correct. And uh, my former boss uh, took this on with uh, a vengeance and managed to get things changed. So we went from 40 to second just as a result of the efforts of the, of the statisticians. Um, it uh, had a major revision in 2010 uh, to uh, try and address some of the weaknesses in the Human Development Index. Um, the early 1990s was when the, um, the start of environmental indicators movement uh, really got underway. And also around about the same time, uh, competency indicators became more and more common in getting increasing media attention. The media loves them because they're a single number by QDP. So it's, uh, it's easy to write a story um, uh, about a competency indicator. It's not so easy when you've got a full range of social indicators or, or environmental indicators. Um, not long afterwards, um, sub subjective measures of well-being um, became uh, more prevalent. Um, uh, and these can usually be based on, on surveys um, where people get asked questions about how they're feeling about life, is it getting better, is it getting worse, and, and so forth. And um, um, you can develop uh, measures of well-being uh, that way. And I'll, I'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses of that in a few moments. Um, 2000 at the UN level, um, and this was mainly aimed at developing countries, um, not the um, OECD countries, uh, of which Australia is one. But they had a major um, um, effort in creating Millennium Development Goals. Um, I think there was about nine of them. And they supported this by um, a series of indicators. And a huge effort was uh, put into uh, developing, you know, doing the statistical work to um, develop uh, these indicators. And in 2015, I think it was, um, they were replaced by something that's called uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. And there's a set of indicators to support the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think there's something of the order of 150. So uh, again, that's uh, a fairly major, uh, a fairly major activity. And with the Sustainable Development Goals, there's much more em emphasis on getting um, data from uh, the developed countries and not just the you know, developing countries. Um, MAP, which I mentioned before, um, the Australian, uh, first Australian um, um, indicators project that, um, uh, that started, uh, well, I've got 2003 there, but it actually, uh, I think it came out late 2002. Then in 2004, um, the OECD held its first forum on measuring wellbeing in fostering the progress of societies. And they actually were um, inspired by the um, Australian work. And uh, I actually was given the um, lead speaker role uh, at this World Forum. So again, that surprised me that um, I thought what we did was you know, quite nice, but I didn't think it was uh, so innovative that um, uh, you would be the, uh, the, the headline speaker uh, for this particular forum. And OECD worked on this continually of had a number of world forums and uh, in 2011 uh, they published OECD Federal Life Index. Um, there's four broad approaches to measuring wellbeing. One, one is um, a suite of indicators um, using a structured framework. So it's not just a big long list of indicators, so it's structured and organised in some way. And uh, MAP uh, is, is that of that um, type of, uh, uses that type of approach as do Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals. And as does the New Zealand Wellbeing Indicators, uh, which I'll talk briefly about later on. Uh, composite Indicators, the other, other approach, the Human Development Index I, I mentioned is one such example as is Andy, the, um, the project that's going on at present um, in, in Australia, as is the Canadian Index of Wellbeing. Uh, there is the adjustment to GDP approach, which I, I mentioned, and um, the gender and progress indicator is one example, and green GDP is, um, is another example, and subjective measures of, um, of well-being. Um, now, just some strengths and weaknesses um, uh, compared with the suite of indicators approach. Um, composite indicators, uh, they're one, one advantage is they're very much more digestible. 
uh, digestible summary, which can attract headlines. Um, but there are serious questions about the, uh, the validity um, of the composite indicator, because it, it does require, um, uh, requires weights, um, and it also requires um, some form of adjustment to, to the variables, and uh, I'll talk briefly about that later on. Um, the weights are often uh, based on value judgment, and uh, they, they, they will vary. Um, you know, some people regard the environment as extremely important, more important than other things, where others might focus on health and education as being uh, uh, the most important part, aspects of well-being. And uh, well-being isn't a, a simple com uh, concept, so uh, oversimplifying it um, into a single number uh, may be just going a bit too far. And also, when you've got a single number, it, it's, uh, it, it does have limited analytical value. Um, you can see what's going up or down, but if it's going up, you, want, you will want to know why it's going up. Likewise, if it's going down. Um, adjusted GDP has, um, uh, it's also a single number with similar weaknesses to composite indication, is to composite indicators. And um, the biggest issue is uh, evaluation difficulties with adjustments to GDP. So if environments get getting worse, how do you actually put a, a, a number on that? Uh, GDP's um, uh, got a numeraire based on um, uh, on dollars or on the currency of the of a particular country. And it's not so easy to provide valuations for uh, the uh, additions and subtractions you might be making wanting to make to GDP. Um, Subjective measures of well-being are relatively easy to measure, but what you find is uh, an individual expectations um, change over time and space. So it, they, they provide, over time, they provide very, very um, flat measures. Um, so there's not um, a much of a difference between, between people's subjective, uh, subjective well being when it was measured in the 1950s, say, uh, compared with now. But if we uh, put a 1950s lifestyle on, um, on current Australians, I think they uh, would expect their well being, uh, they would have said their well being is a lot worse. And likewise, um, you know, for different population groups, um, the, the, the poorest member of the members of our community, their, their uh, feeling about their well-being isn't vastly different to um, uh, those who are in the high-income groups. In fact, the groups that come out best are uh, uh, recently retired people who are still healthy, you know, got a reasonable income and live near the beach. Well, we can't all do that. So uh, you know, I think there's measures uh, uh, are interesting, but they've got limited usefulness. Um, the suite of indicators approach also has weaknesses. It, it, um, it, uh, it's selective on what dimensions uh, it uses. There's judgments on which uh, indicators you might use. Though um, something that MAP has done is using a, a dashboard uh, to help with interpretation whether things are getting better or worse. Uh, so you can use you know, red, amber, and green light, for example. Um, uh, to do on, on each of the indicators, and if there's a lot of red lights, I guess you can make the uh, judgment that things are, are getting worse. Um, so I'll just um, give a, um, a a brief outline to uh, the board approach. Uh, first of all, some terminology. Um, we use um, um, domains as the, um, the broadest concept. So uh, a, a domain may be the ecosystem. Uh, or it may be um, the human system. Um, within the domains, you have dimensions. Within the human uh, system, you may have um, health as a dimension, or education, or work. And then for each of those dimensions, there are indicators in which we, uh, we choose um, a relatively small number. And uh, for each of those indicators, there will be a measure. And the measure may not be precisely, uh, uh, may not be precisely what indicator is. So quite often we have to use a proxy measure. Um, the objective um, varies from uh, project to project. Uh, the most common concepts, uh, well-being, quality of life, progress, sustainability. Uh, there's a lot of overlap uh, here, but well-being is what we used in, uh, in MAP. Um, what sort of framework will you use? Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll go to um, this slide and then I'll come back again. So this is the, the framework um, 
And it's pretty close to the framework we used in the ABS, but it, it, I've actually got this slide from um, a project that I worked on a, on a standard topics report. And um, you can see the framework uh, recognises uh, uh, two domains, the human system, the ecosystem. And within the human system, uh, it recognises human well-being, individual well-being, and uh, that should be society uh, well-being. Um, you can see there's um, flows between the ecosystem and the humus, human system, that the um, ecosystem provides a number of services uh, to, uh, to the human system. Uh, recreational services, for example, and the human system impacts on the ecosystem. Um, but also the human system um, can um, try to um, rectify um, some of the uh, um, um, weaknesses or some of the uh, uh, damage to the ecosystem and that can be through uh, resource management. So that's another interaction between the human system and the, and the ecosystem. So I'll just go back again. So that's um, a, an example of, of a framework. And for many of your projects, uh, they've got a they use a framework that's not vastly different to that. Um, we have to choose which dimensions. Um, some are obvious, like health and education. Um, others are less obvious, and they will vary from, from country to country. Um, what, what are the indicators for each dimension? Uh, and what will I be based on? And MAP tried to have a single outcome focus headline indicator for each uh, dimension. And I'll give a few examples just to illustrate the point um, shortly. What measures do we use for each indicator? Particularly if there's um, not a available measure for the indicator, you might have to uh, go to a proxy measure. And it, quite often uh, there is no um, suitable measure. Um, and um, uh, in the sustainable um, development goals, you'll find for many countries there's no data at all. Um, what length of time series um, should you have? What are the data sources? Uh, in MAP, we used 10 years. We felt you needed a reasonably long time series to actually really assess whether things were getting better or worse. Uh, it's very limited in what you can say based on two or three years' data. Uh, there's issues like the treaties of linkages between dimensions. And what sort of analysis and comparisons uh, do you want to make? Um, in MAP, we did comparisons across states, we did comparisons of, across different population groups. But what was of particular interest was comparisons with other OECD countries. And if you use a composite index, how do you determine the weights and how do you standardize indicators uh, so they're not dominated by uh, um, um, so more volatile, or, or I should say, the indicators which tend to move uh, greater it, to a greater extent in relative terms. You don't want them to dominate the movements in the index. Okay, well um, now just some some types of indicators. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Map um, was using outcome indicators, um, and uh, examples of those are. Uh, health status and uh, life expectancy. Uh, here I'm using health, uh, the health um, dimension uh, as a, a means of illustrating these different types of indicators. Um, for risk factors, you might look at things like smoking and weight. For inputs, you're looking at things like health finance, the number of health professionals, hospital beds and so forth. Um, and then you may have process or output measures, um, or you may have performance metrics. Uh, like waiting list or or, or um, um, possible productivity measures. Um, most pro indicator projects use a mixture, to be honest. Uh, in MAP, we very much wanted to focus on outcome indicators. And uh, so that's what we used as a headline indicators. But we also had a range of supplementary uh, indicators uh, rather than just having uh, a single we had a single headline indicator, but rather than just looking at that, we, uh, we had a, a, a range of uh, supplementary indicators. So we did talk about things like uh, smoking, um, health professionals, and, and so forth. Um, now, uh, measures of Australia's uh, progress. Um, we used the suite of indicators approach, um, and um, uh, we, we had domains, dimension indicators, measures, the, uh, the four broad domains we use were society, 
economy, environment, and governance. So, um, compared with that diagram I showed you before, we, we recognise as society and economy and governance as separate um, domains within that part of the diagram. Um, the 2004 edition, there were 20 um, dimensions, um, seven for society, four for the economy, four for the environment, and five for governance. Uh, supplementary indicators, as I, as I mentioned. And the criteria for headline, headline indicators, as well as uh, being outcome focused, so they, uh, they had to be relevant. And importantly, movements had to be associated with progress. Um, that, that is, positive movements had to be associated with progress by uh, most Australians. And divorces was an example uh, where we had quite a bit of a debate. And in, in the end, we didn't include it because uh, you could argue on one side an increase in divorces is bad sign so um, you know, families breaking down and so forth, but on the other side, uh, people being able to divorce may, uh, may uh, mean the end of an unhappy relationship, which is uh, not good for uh, all the people who are involved in that relationship. So that was one example where it's not clear cut, so we didn't include it. Uh, we also wanted uh, measures that were available on an annual basis, so they couldn't be based on a census, for example, which is only uh, five yearly. Uh, so I'm just here um, giving you uh, some examples um, for society. Um, one of the dimensions was health. The indicator we uh, wanted was healthy life expectancy, um, and the measure we used uh, was life expectancy at birth. Um, if I just move on to economy, uh, financial hardship was the domain. Uh, sorry, it was the dimension. Um, and the indicator we want was to equivalise disposable income. Equivalise uh, means uh, making adjustments for the, uh, uh, the size of a household. So um, uh, single person households have got, um, uh, they require less uh, income um, to survive a bit of it than uh, a five person household, you have two parents and, and three children. So uh, we used um, some factors that have actually been calculated by the OECD to um, work out equivalent disposable income. So it's not, it doesn't mean that a five-person household needs five times as much income as a single household, because obviously there, uh, there's some economies of scale and things like uh, rent and whatnot uh, don't increase five times. Um, and the measure we used was the equivalent disposal income of those in the second and third lowest decile. And we eliminated the lowest decile because um, um, for a number of reasons, there was a lot of nonsense in the data um, um, and uh, you know, a lot of noise there that uh, where, where the data was likely to be wrong. Um, there's a lot of people who are income poor but um, asset rich and uh, and, and not really uh, poor in, the, in uh, the true sense of the word. And we also had a lot of people, you know, nuns were one example, that had very low income, but uh, um, they you know, had shelter and were being fed and so forth. So again, you, you wouldn't regard them as people who were being in relative poverty. Environment, um, the um, dimension was international environmental concerns, greenhouse gas emissions was the, uh, um, uh, was the, uh, the uh, indicator, and we did have a measure on net greenhouse gas emissions. Um, then on governments, one example is crime, uh, with crime victimisation being an indicator, uh, and that's one where we actually used uh, two headline indicators, victims of personal crime and victims of household crime. Um, MAP was released um, um, for a number of years, uh, and also, that, that's in hard copy publication form, um, and electronically for um, in most years from 2006. Um, and yearly issues were, were supported by the coalition of the government at the time. This was the Howard government, where Peter Costello was the treasurer who I reported to, and both he and uh, the treasurer were very supportive of uh, our uh, work in this area. Um, this is after I left the AB, ABS, but they did a major study which I referred to as MAP, Aspirations of a Nation, which uh, is an interesting read. Um, um, it's almost 10 years out of date now, I guess, but, and maybe things have changed. But what it, uh, 
it did was summarise um, the views of Australians and what they regarded as uh, uh, as important uh, to uh, their well-being and the country's well-being. Uh, MAP is currently shelved. Um, it's um, not something that's hugely popular with the uh, with the current coalition government. Um, uh, they used uh, uh, the budget as a reason for uh, cancelling the project, I think. And uh, I, I think I might have mentioned before, um, MAP was the stimulus for OECD's uh, measuring wellbeing and beyond GDP uh, initiatives. Uh, the Labor Party is likely to renew MAP if it's elected. Um, uh, there's a quote um, from um, uh, Jim Chalmers uh, saying that Australia would get an annual update uh, on the nation's wellbeing from life expectancy to child poverty alongside the federal budget. And the pro proposal being examined by Shadow Treasurer Jim Chalmers. Um, Josh Fornberg, as Treasurer, uh, uh, poured cold water on this suggestion. So, uh, uh, it didn't look like there's going to be any uh, change in mind from the current coalition government. Um, the OECD initiatives, um, the Beyond GDP initiative is really um, about trying to develop indicators for as clear and as appealing as GDP, but more inclusive environmental and social aspects of progress. Um, and uh, they've had a range, I, I think, of roughly two yearly conferences and workshops. Uh, to try and, uh, and advance this. And a number of countries uh, are now, uh, quite a large number of countries are doing something along the lines of, of measures of Australia's progress. Uh, they've also um, um, got a product called the Better Life Index. Uh, and um, it's got an underlying uh, database uh, with data from all the OECD countries. And I think I, my next graph actually shows you the um, indicators they've got. Um, and uh, it's actually an interactive tool that uh, uh, allows you to see how countries perform, not just uh, really on, on each of those um, uh, 11 topics, but uh, um, compared with each other uh, uh, after you uh, weight those 11 topics according to uh, uh, what importance you, uh, you give to them. So if you think the environment's very important, you would give that a high weight. If you think some other aspect of uh, progress is not quite as important, you give it a low weight and uh, uh, you can actually see um, how Australia, for example, compares with, um, uh, with Norway or, or United Kingdom uh, and so forth. But uh, probably what's more um, interesting is actually seeing how the different countries actually compare with each other on the, uh, on the, on the 11 different topics and the indicators that comprise those topics. So um, the OECD Better Life Index, it's based on um, uh, um, two uh, main domains, um, material living conditions and quality of life. Under material living conditions, it looks at housing, income and jobs, quality of life, it looks at community education, environment, governance, health, life, satisfaction, safety and work-life balance. And for each of those uh, um, dimensions, there's one to four indicators. And Australia's in the top, Portal of the OECD countries for all dimensions except jobs, safety, and work life balance. Um, and uh, in jobs, uh, uh, we, um, we're just outside the top quartile, but we're relatively poor on um, job security and long term unemployment rates. Uh, for safety, uh, uh, the area where we're, 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 uh, we're relatively weak is feeling safe walking alone. Uh, which surprised me a little bit, but uh, we're below the 25 percentile uh, on that aspect. And on a work-life balance, um, this one doesn't uh, surprise me because we actually work quite low among the uh, OECD countries. So our time devoted to leisure, and, and, and uh, which includes sporting activities, was quite low compared with other OECD countries. And we also tend to work very long hours. Uh, particularly compared to the European countries. So, life's reasonably good in Australia, um, but uh, except for those, uh, those three areas. Um, right, I, I, um, I won't go through this in, in great detail, but uh, as I mentioned, weights for each dimension are signed by the users to so they can build and customise their own index and they uh, 
Uh, they rate uh, topics from zero, not important to five, very important. Um, you have to normalize these variables because they're, you know, got um, different numerators. So uh, um, you, you could be comparing an indicator which has got numbers in the, in the hundreds with no, that one has got uh, numbers that are in single digits. So um, you've got to uh, standardize in some way. Uh, the way they do it is uh, they um, get a number between naught and one according to the formula I've got there, which is the uh, value minus the minimum value divided by the maximum value um, minus the minimum value. Uh, so you get numbers uh, going uh, from zero to one and, and you will get some numbers that are zero um, and you'll get some numbers that are one, of course. So that can, uh, I, th I think it causes some, uh, some problems when you uh, um, when you want to try and combine um, the uh, different indicators. Uh, for what the OCD does, it's not so, so much of a problem because they're, uh, uh, they're just creating a, um, an average um, using equal weights. So it, it, you know, if you've got a zero, uh, that goes into, uh, uh, it, it goes into numerator, but it doesn't change the numerator. Um, but there is a one that goes into the denominator. So you can still um, calculate uh, calculate an average. So uh, I guess it works there, but when we tried to look at it for Andy, um, it caused uh, some difficulties. So we had to uh, not use that approach. Um, so talking about Andy, um, here are some key features. Uh, it, it is in, intended to be a composite index, um, which will be based on 12 uh, dimensions. Uh, I've just mentioned free of new health, education, and economic life. Uh, the intention is that it be published annually, uh, so it will be largely reliant on annual data. Um, essentially, a social wellbeing measure. It's using a very similar fr framework to the OEC Bet Better Life Index, and environment is the only non social wellbeing dimension that's included. Uh, it's also intended to uh, calculate a competency indicators for each of the 12 dimensions. And there'll be 12 indicators for each, um, each of those 12 dimensions. Um, and uh, you know, the reasoning behind this is that what they plan to do is, you know, rather than just having one annual big splash release, that they would uh, each month release another um, you know, composite index for each dimension. So I guess the continual um, coverage of what uh, Andy's trying to do. Um, the 12 indicators are to be determined by uh, expert panels um, and um, uh, have already done it for uh, education and health. Uh, Fiona Stanley, who was a former Australian of the Year and a very well-known person, led the health panel. Uh, and this work uh, is not just uh, expert work, but they actually did some surveys, uh, some uh, population surveys, a lot using the term democratic surveys. Um, to uh, assess the relative importance that the public places on um, the, the different dimensions and different indicators. And likewise, they use focus groups to uh, try and obtain the same sort of information. Uh, but unlike MAP, they haven't um, focused on a single type of indicator. They've got a mixture of out outcome, output, and input indicators. And again, the weights are to be determined democratically using household surveys. So. Um, the intention is that they um, will have a different weight for each of those uh, 12, uh, 12 dimensions and also a different weight for each of the uh, 12 indicators within the 12 dimensions. Um, in the pilot work that's been done on health and education, uh, there's not a huge difference between the weights because uh, you know, some people think some things are important and um, others think other things are important. So there's, a, there's an averaging effect. So in the end, uh, there wasn't a huge um, difference between um, the different weights, so I'm not sure it's, uh, it's going to be worth the effort. Uh, that project's currently on hold um, because of funding difficulties. The University of Melbourne provided the uh, funding for the pilot test, but they're uh, not continuing that, particularly in uh, today's circumstances. But um, the Ramsey Foundation has uh, indicated that they may support this work, so it may be able to continue in the near future. Right, okay, well, um, I wanted to talk about some of the, briefly about some of the issues with composite indexes. Um, the first one is, uh, 
Um, how do you, do you deal with the uh, the fact that the uh, the, big, the, the measures with the uh, the biggest uh, percentage movement have the most uh, influence on the direction of the index? Uh, so that's um, one thing that we've had to address. And I'll just move over to this table. And um, if you look at um, the column headed uh, 5N, um, this is um, a measure of long-term uh, unemployment. This is in Canada. Um, uh, it's it's fairly old data now, but it's um, it's still relevant to illustrate the point that I want to make. So for that variable, um, you can see uh, it was a period of uh, good economic times, and unemployment went down from 17.4 to 6.7. So it uh, uh, is only about um, 30 or 40 percent of what it was at the start of that series. Well, there's other variables. If you look at seven. Um, the, uh, the movement in that um, variable, which is uh, an index of employment quality, uh, is has hardly moved at all. And even the next one, uh, which is housing affordability, even though it's moved more, it's nowhere near as much as uh, long-term unemployment. So when the um, Canadians calculate their, their index, uh, they they turned all they rescaled all these so that um, they are based around 100 and then they used equal weights. But in doing that, um, the, it was the variable five, the long-term unemployment index, which was dominating the movements in, uh, in their measure. And that was true in the other, other uh, aspects. So we wanted to get away from that problem because um, uh, um, they were making statements like um, living standards in Canada were um, improving quite rapidly and it was being driven by improvements in the long-term um, unemployment, even though things like housing affordability were, were getting worse, uh, income distribution was getting worse, uh, and employment quality was uh, uh, deteriorating. So it, it, it was, uh, uh, it, it didn't sort of seem intuitively correct that the sort of statements I'm making. Um, um, how do you calculate the weights? Well, Andy's using uh, what they could refer to as a democratic weight, uh, deriving them from uh, um, from survey respondents, uh, making assessments on what they regard as the uh, the relevant, uh, relevant importance of the um, of the different indicators. Uh, you could um, actually uh, use something like principal component or factor analysis if you had a survey data set, a simple survey data set um, to derive weights. And uh, I, I would be more in favour of doing something like that, I think. Um, also, um, what formula do you use? Um, we looked at using the OECD index formula, but we dismissed that fairly quickly for some reasons I alluded to uh, a little while ago. So what we we are working around um, is use of Z-scores. So uh, we haven't fully resolved uh, all the difficulties with using this calls either. It's not that's not even not straightforward. Okay, so desirable um, properties of a confidence index, and this is why you know, Z scores aren't. Um, uh, even though we can use them, we can't use them um, uh, uh, in a in a in a simple form. We've got to make some adjustments. So we need to uh, uh, have a base period where the index equals one hundred for each indicator and the index as a whole. That can be the start of it, the time series you've got, or, or maybe it's the middle, or maybe it's the end. That's a you know, question that uh, can be addressed. But there, if you, you want to make not only the index as a whole 100, but you also want to make each of the uh, parts of it uh, that, uh, 100 as well. Um, and ideally, you don't want past values of the index to change with the addition of another year's data. This used to be one of the issues we got with um, with GDP that uh, we got accused of um, getting rid of a recession um, back in the 1980s, 90s, just by uh, re-estimating um, uh, the numbers um, um, you know, based on new sets of weights and so forth. So we wanted to, and Andy, as we now do in GDP, not to change um, the past numbers, unless it's based on new number rather than uh, rebasing the index. So these sorts of things are common problems for index numbers such as the CPI. And what they do is um, rather than re, uh, recompile the whole index, they 
splice the latest estimates of change onto the base period. So the latest estimate change is uh, plus 5%, for example. Um, the index would go from 100 to 105. And then periodically they rebase index. And um, uh, so I think that's an approach we'll have to, uh, uh, have to use with Andy. And we've got a ex former ABS uh, index number expert to uh, help us with it once we get Andy project going in. Um, well, okay, I think I can um, uh, skip the next point. Um, the, one of the problems with the Z numbers is also that we've got a relatively small number of observations to estimate the S, which is the denominator in the S, Z score. Uh, for Andy, we're going back 10 years, so it's only 10, um, 10 variables. And um, that uh, estimate of S may really change as we get more, more time periods. But we think what we should do is not change it until we do a rebasing. So I'm running short of time, so I'll move on. Um, uh, the New Zealand approach, um, this was um, uh, actually led by the, uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, she was the one who wanted this work done, it was her direction. And uh, they wanted to take a broader approach to wellbeing rather than just rely on economic growth. Um, and New Zealand Treasury, that actually established their own living standards framework, which is very much uh, based on the OSD better life framework, and that was actually used to drive their last budget. Stats New Zealand have developed a, a set of indicators, um, social, economic, and environmental, uh, and um, they have not been driven by data building in the sense that if there's no data available, they've still got the indicator listed with the uh, hope that data will become available sometime in the near future. And um, uh, I'll just show you briefly um, some of the uh, Indicators use, they're using, and they both cover both current and future wellbeing. And um, it was based on a very extensive public consultation process, uh, not just of experts, but they actually went out to uh, the public to see what they thought was important uh, to wellbeing in New Zealand. So uh, I'm not going to go through these um, um, one by one, but um, there are a list of the uh, um, the current uh, wellbeing indicators that they used. Um, they have got subjective wellbeing, as you can see in the bottom right hand um, corner. Um, and for future wellbeing, they looked at things like uh, financial and physical capital. I guess that's fairly easy, easy to measure. Human capital, I'm not sure how they're measuring that. I guess that uh, will um, we use accumulated um, sort of qualification across the population, something along those lines national capital and social capital. Um, neither of those are easy concepts to measure, but there are, there are proxy measures. Uh, and they also uh, had um, indicators on the impact on the risk world and some contextual indicators. Um, so there's some other influential um, international developments. I won't go through all of these, but I'll just mention a few. Um, Bhutan got a lot, of, a lot of publicity because uh, I think they called the Gross National Happiness Index and they, they said they wanted to measure happiness. Uh, but when you look below the surface, uh, they did include things like psychological well-being, but they also comprised a, uh, a lot of the traditional indicators like GDP. So they, they did a pretty good job of marketing, I think, uh, when they referred to this happiness index because it's, it's, it's probably not all that different to map uh, in the total scheme of things. Um, I'll skip down to um, the French, um, it was President Sarkozy commissioned uh, uh, a study on uh, the measure of economic performance and social progress. And he engaged um, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, um, Sen, I've forgotten his first name, and, and Fatusi. Uh, two of those, Stiglitz and Sen, were both Nobel Prize winners, and Fatusi, I don't think he did, but he's certainly a very highly regarded economist. Um, so that was a, a right-wing uh, president uh, uh, commissioned some very high-powered people uh, to, to look at that. And their report uh, has been used not just in France, but it's been used widely through, uh, uh, through the world. Um, USA um, got interest in this for a while, though it seems to uh, um, um, run into a dead end with the uh, current administration. Uh, they had something called the State of USA, uh, which um, 
was initiated by the Government Accounting Office, the Audit Office, in the National Academy of Science. So uh, it was interesting that it came from the Audit Office. And it was endorsed and funded by um, President Obama, but as I said, it now seems to have been discontinued. And UK has got something that's still going. It started in 2011, and again, it was initiated by a Conservative government, uh, the current Conservative government. And um, if you're interested, you should look at the Office of National Statistics website because uh, not only do they have a lot of uh, indicator measures there, but they have some uh, quite interesting articles. Um, the role of this National Statistical Office, um, uh, I might skip that one, except to say that they are obviously a, um, a very important provider of the data, uh, of the data that might be used in those projects. And uh, um, though they will not publish Compass Index. And um, just I'll conclude with um, a message from the previous Australian statistician. Um, who uh, couldn't attend at a um, workshop that I was involved in organising, but he did want to pass on a message of support for the continued discussion of this important dimension. Uh, whilst I, ABS is not able to produce MAP at this stage, where the current funding, many of the underlying information sources are still being collected, and the funding we have just received for a timely survey, enhancement of our labour market information, our forthcoming social surveys, and the expansion of reporting through this System of Economic Environmental Accounts do help better understand the broader range of dimensions of life in Australia. So um, uh, they're, they're very supportive of this type of work, even though their hands are tied at all their present. And I have um, a number of references. Um, if uh, you've got more interest in this work, and uh, I think Damien's going to um, um, uh, distribute the slides um, perhaps later this week. So I'll finish there, Damien. So if there's uh, any questions, I'll, I'm happy to try and answer them. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, yes, we've got a number of questions coming through. Um, I'll start with one of the, uh, the first one. It's a bit long, so I'm just going to paraphrase it. So question that is as follows. Can you speak up? I'm having a bit of trouble hearing you. Okay. Um, I'll, uh, be as close as I can to my microphone. So the question is about uh, what are we are measuring. So we first need to be clear about what we are measuring. So what does well-being mean? Is there, a, is there an agreed definition of well-being? Or if not, do you have a definition of well-being you'd like to share? So it makes sense that we want to know this before we can think about what, um, uh, yeah, what are the uh, variables. Well, it's a good question, but a difficult one. Um, uh, there probably are de uh, definitions of well-being, but I can't quote uh, what they are. Um, and uh, I think in, what, in our first issue of MAP, we actually uh, uh, wrote down what we regarded as well-being. But in, in uh, many ways, it's described by the, uh, the dimensions uh, of, of well-being uh, that are consistent with the, with the definition. But I don't have a, a, a definition in front of me, so I can't answer the uh, question directly. Okay, uh, I'll move to the next uh, question. What, what I can do um, is I, I um, after, this, um, after we finish here, I'll um, send you a copy of the definition of ABS used and perhaps you might distribute that with a slide pad. Sure, that sounds great. Uh, so the next question is about subpopulations with disadvantage. So for example, Indigenous Australians. So should we compete, compute wellbeing separately for these subgroups? Uh, you, uh, I, I, yes, yes, we should. Um, uh, and uh, I should have mentioned this, uh, and Andy, uh, that's what things are, are going to do. Um, and um, uh, we we recognise the need in MAP, but I, um, uh, I don't think, certainly if it happened, it was after my time, I don't think we actually um, produced a, a, a separate um, measure of uh, progress of Indigenous Australians. Um, one of the issues is that what they regard as important is quite different to um, the, uh, the rest of the population, the non-Indigenous population. Uh, spirituality is uh, more important to Indigenous people than what it is to uh, most uh, other Australians on average. 
and there's uh, other aspects you know things like um, um, uh, health and community and things like that may be uh, much more important than um, in indigenous communities than um, for others so we we did we didn't want to just um, um, count rick up that map uh, for the uh, indigenous population because uh, we thought that would um, not give you a, a very good answer that because it wouldn't take into a sufficient account things that, that indigenous people that are important but also um, they don't like being compared with the rest of the population when i went to new zealand it was the same thing was true there the maori population didn't like being compared with the rest uh, they wanted to actually look at whether they were pr progressing within their own um, uh, with their own uh, subpopulation rather than uh, saying oh you're still behind the rest of australia they wanted to actually know whether they things were actually improving or getting worse for their own populations so thanks dennis uh, we've got a few more uh, more technical stats questions uh, so that this one is can you tell us more about how to use pca or factor analysis to determine the weights uh, um, no. Um, uh, no, I, look, I, I can't. It's a long, uh, it's uh, probably 50 years since I've, uh, um, uh, well, at least 45 years since I've actually done a uh, principal component of factor analysis uh, uh, myself. I, I, you know, I know what the te techniques are and uh, what they achieve, but um, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. No worries, uh, perhaps the, some of the links that you're sharing with us might help uh, answer that. Okay, uh, so the next question is, so are there any methods that can be used to correct for changing expectations in subjective measures? Um, there probably are, um, though I can't tell you, um, what they are, um, th there must be. Um, uh, again, I'll see what I can find out and, and, and get back to you because it, it's no, it's it, it's no means the problem uh, that people adjust to their circumstances, uh, and um, so you would think there has to be um, some means of of making um, some um, adjustment in the measure to uh, allow for that fact. Um, I, you know, I guess you could, um, uh, after asking people this range of questions for the current situation, you could hypothesise and create a, uh, uh, a situation where, um, which reflected life, say, 20 years ago, and see how they feel then. So there probably would be methods, but I, I need to do a bit of research to see what's actually been used in, uh, in practice. Okay. Okay, so the next question is like this. So have you incorporated a harm index for crimes against the person and types of victimization? And what about other traumatic life events like road trauma, witnessing suicide, or miscarriage? Sorry, I, I didn't get all that question. So yeah. could you just repeat so please? The first part was, have you incorporated a harm index for crimes against the person and types of victimization? And then what about other traumatic life events like road trauma, witnessing suicide and miscarriage? Um, well, look, in, um, a, a map uses only uh, indicators. You know, it, it's, uh, I, I, I think, uh, uh, I think of data being uh, a bit like an inverted triangle uh, and the indicators are at the top. Uh, and then you've got the, uh, at the very, very bottom, you've got the raw data and then in the middle, you've got things like tables and things. Um, so, uh, for the in map for, for crime, we, we chose a couple of headline indicators, which was uh, the homicide rate. Uh, the homicide rate in what was it? Was, uh, it was yeah, what do you call it? Um, uh, oh, victims of uh, 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 sorry, it was victims of personal crimes and victims of household crime. But we did have supplementary indicators on things like uh, murders uh, and uh, some other other variables. Uh, but if you really want to get into that sort of detail, 
it's not uh, it's not available on map. Map only gives you the sort of the top of that triangle. Um, but there's other ABS publications that provide that much more detail data, um, and particularly um, more detail on um, uh, on crime victimisation and the demographics that are involved uh, in, in, with crime victims as well. Okay, the next question is about uh, public policy. So, in your view, which attempts to measure well-being have been most effective in influencing public policy, and any ideas why? Mm, okay. Um, uh, it's really only just starting to happen. Um, uh, I think the the, the there, there have been at the subnational level uh, there have been attempts at using um, uh, these indicator measures uh, to directly have an impact on um, on policy uh, two I can think of um, uh, Newfoundland in Canada uh, Oregon in the United States um, uh, there's probably others around. Um, Tasmania, for a period of time, um, uh, was doing this. They had a uh, indicators, um, or indicators publication, and uh, called Tasmania Tasmania Together. Um, this is in the early early two thousands, um, and uh, that had a lot of uh, influence on on government and, and government policy. Uh, that, that that probably died with a, with a change of government. So. But at a national level, it's only really just starting to happen. I think New Zealand's probably the first country that's made a very deliberate attempt uh, at, uh, um, at trying to um, use well-being as a way of uh, um, not only of um, impacting on government policy, but also impacting on budget. So one of the things that happened in the last New Zealand budget was that each policy proposal had to describe uh, what impact on well-being was. Uh, was it positive and why was it positive, which areas, or were there negatives? So, uh, as far as I know, that's the first national attempt to really, um, for, to really have a strong emphasis on, um, on, on policy. Though, as I mentioned, there's been a few uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the state uh, level, and ACT at present uh, is trying to uh, mimic what, uh, what's being done in New Zealand. Uh, so they made an announcement in their last budget in I think it was March uh, that they were going to use well-being as an overlay on uh, on their future future budgets. I'd just like to highlight the second part of that question. So do you have any ideas why particular attempts are more effective than others? Um, well, uh, I think you have to um, uh, be able to convince the, the government of the time. Uh, and these, you know, well, I was going to say they tend to be um, left wing rather than right wing, but uh, that's not true in um, France and UK. The, the initiatives there were led by right wing governments. Um, I, I think you've got to convince the, um, the people that are um, uh, really involved in framing the budget that this is something that's worthwhile doing. And in, in, in most places, that's driven by um, economists who have brought up um, um, where macroeconomics has been their, you know, their dominant uh, way they think. Uh, and um, so there's a bit of inertia involved around that. Um, in Australia, when, when Ken Henry was um, uh, head of Treasury, he actually deliberately uh, uh, changed the focus from being just on uh, the economy, and GDP if you like, to having a, a stronger focus on uh, the environment and on, on social issues. So they, the Treasury at that time, created a framework uh, which they used for make, making assessments against um, various policy proposals. And they looked at environmental impacts, they looked at social impacts. But again, with um, changes of government and with changes of heads of Treasury, that, uh, that went by the wayside. So, it, it hasn't been sustained yet, but I, I, I think its best chance of being sustained is if it's being used and people can see that it's actually making a difference and it's an important way of assessing policy. So I don't think we're there yet, but hopefully in the next decade we will be. 
Okay, so the next question is that the Gini index tries to capture the spread of values. Should we try to measure well-being in a way that captures such a spread? I'm uh, sorry, just like the last bit. So should we try to measure well-being in a similar way? So we're looking at the spread of values. Spread of values. Yes. I'm not quite sure what's meant by that. Uh, uh, I assume it means the spread across the population. Um, uh, one of the things I think that's very hard to uh, hard to do at a uh, at an aggregate level. Um, so it's probably not impossible, an interesting thing to do. But uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the things that we with MAP at least, and I'm sure it's true of other programs, one of the things that people were very interested in was the distribution measures. Um, so um, with income, for example, not just looking at um, you know, whether our average income is going up or down, but you know, how has that been distributed? Um, if you think in terms of a Gini index, is that going up or down? And, and the same with things like, um, you know, like education and, and so forth. And we, we, we actually did a study of what we refer to as multiple disadvantage, where we actually, um, um, I, I can't remember what data said, it must have been a general social survey, but we actually um, looked at the number of Australians who had multiple disadvantage. We, we, um, uh, we defined disadvantage, I can't remember exactly how, but income would have been one of the measures, uh, probably education and health. Um, and we looked at uh, how many Australians were disadvantaged on all those different uh, uh, dimensions of well-being, and um, we were compiled some statistics on um, what type of people, how many, and what type of people uh, had um, uh, uh, suffered from uh, deficit and well-being in, uh, in several different dimensions. Uh, I have a question of my own, which is yeah. you. You mentioned that one of the important factors for having these measures being used is for them to be seen to be used. So I'm wondering what's the role of the media here? I'm guessing they must play a very important role in showing of these course. measures. Yeah, you have to get the media um, very interested. Um, we, we've probably got a bit lucky with our um, uh, first uh, issue of Measures of Australia's Progress. Um, that, um, it was coming out um, uh, just um, before, it came out just, well, actually at the same time as um, um, a, an annual conference at the Institute of, um, um, Institute of Melbourne University, Institute of Economic Research, or I can't remember his exact title. Um, but it was headed by Peter Dawkins at the time and had a lot to do with the ABS, and uh, he asked me if I would... Um, actually do uh, the Australian launch at, um, as part of a conference. Uh, and this was a, a conference that was attended by um, a lot of um, uh, very senior people, including ministers, um, as well as um, um, heads of um, government agencies, um, uh, senior academics and so forth. So it, it, it was quite a, um, uh, quite a powerful audience. And uh, Peter also organised um, George Megalonis, to, um, who was writing for the Australian then, uh, to um, come to the conference and you know, provide uh, various articles about um, what was being said at the conference. And uh, George got very interested uh, in uh, MAP. Um, um, this was before the conference actually started. so. Uh, tell a long story short, we actually got a two-page spread in the Australian free of charge uh, about MAP uh, and uh, they had different stories based on the different indicators. So we got a, a lot of free, uh, free publicity from media and so that certainly helped uh, uh, increase it, the, the knowledge of MAP and its penetration and so forth. And uh, you know, likewise, um, uh, for subsequent issues, if, um, uh, the media plays a very important role in uh, making sure this work is well known. But uh, as someone who's going to release uh, these sorts of publications, you have to also work hard at making not only the media aware of it, but actually uh, producing material, which makes their job a bit easier. So you don't just hand them a 150-page uh, publication and say, you know, here, here's a lot of stories in here. You actually have to uh, 
died them and perhaps help them in uh, deciding what the stories are, you know, providing a few graphs and so forth. So yeah, the media plays a crucial role. Um, unless they get interested in this, it won't go anywhere. Because politicians are actually more influenced by what the media says, uh, or perhaps these days what's said on uh, Twitter and whatnot, rather than uh, uh, what's re released directly through the National Statistics Office. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Uh, I think that's probably a good note to end on. Uh, we've answered all the questions from the audience and we're coming up to time. All right, okay, my pleasure. And I'll go a little bit of homework, which I'll, I'll work on. Thank you very much, Dennis, for kicking off the year for us. And uh, well, I wish, you luck, wish you luck in getting Andy off the ground. And I hope we can follow New Zealand's lead. All right. So thank you, everyone. And uh, everyone listening in, thank you for joining us. And we will share around slides and recordings in due course. Good night and see you next month.